Yes. You may wonder when you saw the news flash why I was starting with Genesis. But uh, of course, Genesis is a passage that tells us how sin came into the world and the reason we need a Saviour. And this Matthew passage is one that promises that the Saviour is finally on his way. Now, Genesis 3 is a rather complicated and intricate passage. You may have many questions about it, and uh, I'm not going to go into all of that right now. I'm actually just going to outline the main players, because they are the same as in every crisis throughout human history. It's God, it's Satan, and it's humanity. Always those three. God has just created everything, <coughs> including humanity. <coughs> humanity currently only consists of two people. And then there is Satan, this evil spirit creature whose origins we don't really know how he came to be there, but we do know that he hates God and he wants to destroy everything that God has created. And uh, he features right at the very beginning of the Bible and he features again, well, every now and again through the story, and then he comes back in <coughs> the very end in Revelation, where he's called the great dragon, that ancient snake called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. So we may not know quite where he came from or how he came to be in the Garden of Eden, but we do know what his main mission is, is to lead people astray, to lead us astray, to tempt humanity, to disobey God. He did it successfully back then in Genesis 3 and he has been doing it ever since. And when you think of this as literal history or a poetic description of something that we can't quite imagine, the fact remains that Satan deceived humanity into disobeying God and the world has been a mess ever since. Humanity is tainted. We have become infected with sin, which is a much worse pandemic than anything, anything else the world has seen, obviously, and it's still going on. And one consequence of this infection, if you like, is our mortality. We all die. Now we may die for various reasons, but the main reason is that humanity walked away from God, disobeyed God, became sinful and mortal. <coughs> and at that point, God could have given up on us. And the good news is that he didn't. And the more you think about that, the more amazing it is that he didn't. Instead, he initiates a plan of salvation, which is, again, already there in Genesis 3. We heard it read, where God says to the snake, to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, I admit, this is not obvious. It's not an obviously messianic verse. And I'm almost certain that Adam and Eve didn't understand what, what he was talking about. But the early church had no problem realizing that this is the very first promise of a savior, a deliverer, somebody who will deal with this issue. The seed of the woman, which is an unusual expression, because women don't produce seed, so it's almost certainly a hint at the virgin conception. The seed of the woman will crush Satan's head, set humanity free from his scheming grasp, if you like. So that promise is there already in Genesis 3. As soon as mankind has fallen, God has started the plan of salvation. And then, we wait. Nothing much happens. Well, Nothing much, you know, only Noah's flood and Abraham and Joseph's multicolored coat and Moses and Jericho and King David, but nothing much in terms of bringing about the promised deliverer. But of course, we did have the prophets who pop up various points during the Old Testament history. They keep trying to keep Israel, the people of God, on the right track with varying success, shall we say. They keep going off the rails, being tempted by Satan, like everybody else. And the prophets also kept reminding them once in a while of this great rescue plan. And 
The best known of them all, I think, must be Isaiah. You've already heard uh, some of his prophecies in Isaiah 53. We've come across many of his prophecies during Advent. Isaiah 53 tells us that somebody seemingly rather unimpressive will come along. If you read the whole, the whole prophecy, he had no beauty and nothing to attract us to him. And this rather unimpressive person will die as a sin offering for our trespasses rather than for his own, and he will still live and see the fruit of his suffering. Now, like Adam and Eve, it's quite unlikely that Isaiah's original audience understood what he was talking about. It's doubtful whether Isaiah himself always understood what he was talking about, that he probably would be one of these highly inspired prophets. I say as if I knew anything about that, but I imagine Isaiah and Zechariah and these prophets who spoke about the coming king, the coming saviour. I really wonder how much they understood themselves. But the early church, of course, had no problem finding Jesus here. There's about 40 different quotes and allusions in the New Testament to Isaiah 53. About 40. Not all direct quotes, but if you count quotes, references, verbal echoes, at least 40 places where they hark back to Isaiah 53. It was very obvious to the early church. This is Jesus, obviously. But Isaiah prophesied about 700 years before Jesus came. The hope is there. The expectation is there, but there is still a lot of waiting. Centuries went by without much sign of this long-awaited saviour. And O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, of course, expresses that longing, that desire, the new God was going to do something. Come on, Lord, do it. Where, where is this deliverer? What's happening? And then, one day, about 700 years after Isaiah, an angel appears to a lonely carpenter in an obscure village called Nazareth in the backwaters of the Roman Empire. Well, I've got my chronology a bit backwards here because this is actually the third angelic appearance in the, the Christmas story. The first Gabriel appears to Zachariah, then to Mary, and it's only after that that he comes to Joseph. We don't actually know that this is Gabriel, by the way. Matthew doesn't name him. I kind of think it's quite likely. So we have these three appearances, and uh, I'm doing them in reverse order this year, just to keep you on your toes. Partly because in all three cases here with uh, Zechariah, Mary, and Joseph, the angel talks about the coming deliverer in slightly different terms. With, Matt, with Joseph in this passage, he refers to him as a saviour. With Mary, he refers to him as a king. And to Zechariah, he talks about John the Baptist being the forerunner of the Lord. So there's a slightly different emphasis in all three appearances. But, of course, in this case, the angel's first job is to reassure Joseph. Don't worry. Don't worry about Mary's unexpected pregnancy. Neither do you to say you're an angel. But uh, don't worry. God is behind it. This is the beginning. God is now beginning to fulfill those age-old promises. And you've probably heard me or others point out before that Joseph's reaction shows that people back then knew just as well as we do where babies come from. Joseph knew that virgins don't have babies. His only explanation obviously was that Mary had been unfaithful. That it was anything supernatural involved, it didn't occur to him any more than it would to anyone today. So he prepares to divorce her quietly, probably so that she wouldn't get executed for adultery. He's trying to be righteous and kind at the same time. Good for him. And maybe that is why he was picked by God to be the Messiah's stepfather, if you like. God had a plan, and that plan did not involve Joseph divorcing Mary, so he has to intervene, tell Joseph that it's all okay, 
Do not be afraid to take Mary home. So he does. Joseph proceeds to take Mary home as his wife, even if they don't sleep together until after Jesus is born. And I imagine that he proceeded to kind of formalize this relationship straight away to protect her. He could have waited until after the baby was born, but the angel tells him, don't worry, marry her. And if you marry her straight away, the scandal might be forgotten. The kind of furore would blow over, and people might even assume that the baby was his after all, and he was just trying to get out of his responsibilities. We don't know. But you have to give Joseph due credit that he took a big risk, he made a big sacrifice, he risked his reputation, clearly, and he agreed to raise a child that wasn't his own, which is apparently still a big problem for some, for some men. And he doesn't even get to name the baby, which, if you have read both uh, angelic appearances, you may have noticed that that is one of the few things that feature in both the Mary story and the Joseph story. You are to give him the name Jesus, or you are to call him Jesus. Because other than that, what the angel says to Mary and what the angel says to Joseph is quite different. But that is the one thing they have in common. You are to give him the name Jesus. Which, in case you didn't know, is the same as the name Joshua in the Old Testament. And it means God saves, or Yahweh, the Lord saves. It was quite a common name in the first century, actually. Jesus is not by any means the only person called Jesus or Joshua in the first century. But, of course, it is the very fitting name for the promised deliverer who comes to deal with the shortcomings of Israel and the world. It is the one, one thing that the angel says to Joseph, but not to Mary. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. He will save his people from their sins. And when I thought about this, I thought there are actually two aspects to this saving us from our sins. And both of them, I realised, are actually hinted at, at least in the, the hymn we sang, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. The first is we sang about defeating the, the devil, Satan, and from depths of hell is thy people saved and give them victory or the grave. That's perhaps the most familiar aspect of saving from our sins, saving us from the consequences of our sin, death and judgment. We're all sinners, we all deserve judgment, but Jesus takes that punishment and provides forgiveness, saving us from the depths of hell. And that featured in the song we just sang after communion as well. As a standard gospel message, you heard me say that many times, we celebrated in communion, Jesus took our sins. The second aspect is maybe less obvious, even though it's equally important. It seems like saving us just from the consequences of our sin, that's not enough. God wants to save us completely. He wants to save us from sin, not just from sins, but from our sin, from our sinfulness. He wants to free us from our inherited sinfulness, make it possible for us human beings to actually go back to the state of Adam and Eve in the garden before they listened to Satan and ate that fruit, which by the way was not an apple. That is much bigger than just dying so that we can be forgiven. I mean, that's great enough. That's a big enough sacrifice, but making it possible for us to actually become sin-free again, go back to what God wanted us to be, that is an even bigger thing. But that's what Jesus does. He comes and he executes a swap, the glorious exchange. He takes our sinfulness from himself, dies on our days, the righteous with the unrighteous, so that we can be made new, we can be made righteous. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Very powerful verse, hidden away there, Second Corinthians. God made him who had no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become righteousness. So, through faith, we can share in his righteousness, be made fit for eternal life. 
even a fig tree or the grave. Or you can put it this way, he becomes like us so that we can become like him. It's a great summary of the good news and the reason why Christmas should be a joyful occasion. We're happy and we make silly jokes at Christmas to kind of celebrate joy. Joy is part of Christmas, it's not something we put on to try and draw in a few visitors. Joy is inherent in the Christmas message. God promised from the very beginning, as soon as Adam and Eve disobeyed, to provide this deliverer that was going to set us free from the consequences of their rebellion. What he didn't reveal back then was that he would actually take on that role himself. God knew that he would have to intervene to sort things out. You know, like he cut up a tree or a child down the well, we can get ourselves into trouble, but we can't get out of it again. We need somebody bigger, stronger, greater than us. And in the case of our sinfulness, there is only God, which is where the other name comes in, the prophetic name, if you like. The Lord himself will give you a sign, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we'll call him Emmanuel. I've always thought this quite funny, really. Matthew quotes that verse about calling the baby Emmanuel straight after the angel has told them to call him Jesus. Bit of a funny discrepancy there, isn't it? There's also a discrepancy in the spelling. Have you noticed that? Every Christmas, I sit when I kind of type out my order service and write down the character. Now, is it I M M O E N M? Well, this year I've decided to actually look it up properly, and it turns out it's either. You can do either. E M M, Emmanuel, is the original Hebrew. I M M, Emmanuel, is a Greek transliteration of the Hebrew. And in the King James Version, which of course was the only one around when a lot of the hymns were written, the King James actually used the Hebrew form of E-M-M in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, but then the Greek form I-M-M in the New Testament, so in Matthew. So you actually have an, obvious, an actual discrepancy there. Nowadays most translations choose one of them, because we are so easily confused nowadays. But, main point here, it doesn't really matter how you spell it. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, the main point is that Jesus is the promised Emmanuel, God with us, coming down to be with us. The virgin conception suggests that Jesus was not just an ordinary child, but it wouldn't necessarily imply divinity in itself. You could have God intervene, make a virgin pregnant without that being the Son of God specifically. The virgin birth suggests that that might be the case. But, not necessarily, we need Isaiah's prophecy to make it clear that this is God with us. God coming down to us, coming to share our life, coming to share our world, coming to defeat Satan and rescue us from his schemes, to make it possible for us to return to his presence, reversing the consequences of Adam's fall. Called the incarnation, if you want a technical theological term for it in the flesh, incarnation. You don't need to know that. Emmanuel is about a much better term, a much easier term to remember. Hebrews describes it like this, using neither of those terms. Since the children have flesh and blood as us, he too, that's Jesus, shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil. Again, harking back to the promise in Genesis 3, breaking the power of Satan. He had to be made, made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. You see different threads and echoes here of the Christmas story, of the promises. But the fact that Jesus had to be made like us, fully human, suggests that he started off being unlike us. He was always the Son of God. He was always God the Son. But he shared in our humanity to break the power of death and sin and the power of the devil. Now, again, it's very doubtful whether Joseph really understood quite what was going on. When God acts, most people don't really understand <coughs> it. At least not why it's going on. I think he was just relieved 
to know that Mary hadn't been unfaithful after all. And I think he was amazed, like incredible, as we might have seen him. The God of his fathers was using his fiance to bring about the promised saviour. I think he was quite overwhelmed and shocked and relieved and happy and incredulous, all of those things at the same time. Did he feel overwhelmed? Yes, I think he did. Wouldn't you? Was he worried about how to cope with this responsibility? Probably. I think he was excited about being part of the outworking of God's plan. I mean, they'd been waiting for centuries. So, he did his bit. He married Mary, and he raised Jesus. And we don't know much more about him. By the time Jesus starts his public ministry, he's probably dead. He's never mentioned anywhere. So he did his bit. Looked after Mary, looked after baby Jesus, raised him to be a carpenter, taught him what he knew, and then he exits the stage again. I think he's a good example for us, really. Because we may not understand everything, we may not understand what God is doing, we may well worry about the future, or our responsibilities, or whatever, but we can still imitate Joseph in obeying and believing that as long as God is with us, it will be okay.